Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, how many people here work in virtual production? All right. How many here want to work in virtual production? <laughs> awesome. Uh, I got a, a really good deck to show you and a demo, live demo um, with, some, with some tools here. Um, I have uh, a bit of a background of how this all started, which is you know, really interesting for me. And then uh, give you some glimpses of things we learned along the way. So this, this uh, it's been a, a really long journey. So, um, but I'm, I'm happy virtual production is finally, you know, getting noticed and taking off. So, uh, hello, <laughs> we've got some VIP guests here. So, um, basically, my background was in film. I was at ILM doing visual effects. Um, we're doing. Uh, beginnings of CG. When I got hired at ILM, there was 34 people. And um, Joel and Terry hired me. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, it was, it was really fascinating working on software back then and, and the whole brand new world of CG. And I got lucky to be the particle guy. So I got to, to develop tornadoes for Twister and, uh, you know, um, the Phoenix rocket launch for Star Trek, uh, First Contact, um, worked on the pod race, the pods crashing, and then, um, also, Perfect Storm, developing the oceans for that. Um, and then I, ma I made a segue to interactive, to real time. And that was uh, kind of where the beginning of where, for me, where all this started. Because here I am, like, uh, used to waiting an hour for a render, and I'm holding a controller. I'm flying around an entire city. And I was like, does everybody else see this, what I'm seeing? I mean, it was on the PS2, <laughs> mind you. And yes, everything had to fit in seven and a half megabytes. I'm not kidding. That's not a joke. <laughs> seven and a half megs. The entire city, all the textures, all the animation, all the characters. And I don't know if that included audio or not, maybe. But it was, you know, the machine had 32 megs of RAM, and then we had to slice off some for the vehicles and some for the, you know. AI and all these things. So it's seven and a half megs. Uh, so my artists would play tricks on me and they'd derez things and see if I'd notice. You know, uh, it was quite interesting. I'll spare you my reel, but you guys have seen some of these projects. Uh, so anyway, combination of you know, twelve years uh, in film, twelve years in real time, pieced the two together. I went to Electronic Arts, uh, art directing games, and then I went to Microsoft, and uh, that's where kind of this all started. Um, at Microsoft, I was given the green light to uh, collaborate with James Cameron to develop something for virtual production. At the time, it, we intended it for his next project, but of course, you know, it's that was 2010. So we we've d done a bunch of stuff along the way, and he's uh, has some great solutions that uh, he's developing with Weta. But basically, um, uh, the the project that started back in 2010 uh, with, with consulting with Cameron. Uh, got used on Jungle Book, Ready Player One, and Blade Runner, and Greyhound, uh, most recently, the Tom Hanks uh, uh, World War II film. So uh, going back to what we learned, uh, it, was it was fantastic to experience the early days of working in, in, uh, at ILM. The, the, on, the, on the Star Wars pod race, uh, we started doing things like doing an entire simulation of a destruction or crash, and then filming it afterwards. This is it sounds really logical, but it was very rare because typically in film, every shot's done as a standalone. It's just how it works. You know, everything's cheated. Everything's you know. Um, but John Ola and I were, were you know keen on tr trying to make it all work as one. On Perfect Storm, we had to visualize whether the camera would be contained within the 100 by 100 foot stage. So this was what I would say the early days of what we called previs. Um, where we were running the simulations near real time on a SGI and watching the ships react to the waves. And then we constrained the tank to the ship so we could tell uh, if the camera's going to be outside, which it, it, you went a bunch of times. But that was a great way to visualize what we can see. Uh, then when I joined EA uh, in 2003, we started doing uh, in-game camera systems called ICE, uh, in-game camera editor. And that was basically an entire editor just using the controller. So you could drive the car, perform some take, and then hit a button, and then do all your camera cuts to it. And this tool became really powerful. All the in-game cameras in Need for Speed Most Wanted uh, and Underground are done using this tool. We used it on James Bond, Everything or Nothing. And then uh, Ice used it, uh, sorry, Skate used it for actually the players. So they could skateboard and then film what they shot. Um, 
So big bold statement. Um, you know, having having seen glimpses of deploying this stuff on films, uh, it's not just oh you can do faster previs. That's not it. Uh, it's completely not what you think. Uh, we started early on with Alex McDowell on Disney's Order of Seven, the film that got put on hold, but that was uh, you know early 2012. Basically, uh, it affects every aspect of production. Every person that works on a film is going to do a different job if they can use these tools, and that's what we that's what we experienced firsthand. Uh, so what we learned from Cameron was all the things that he you know wanted to improve on um, uh, doing Avatar One, and you know he was. He was limited with the number of polygons, the lighting, of course. Um, and it was early days. But he gave us a list of 25 things that he really wanted that he didn't have. And um, you know, among them was like uh, less lag so he could shoot live. It was you know, 7 to 15 frames. We got it to two frames when we did the demo to him. He was very happy. Um, able to select objects. Um, uh, you know, controls of how he wanted to control lighting. Th th these are like fundamental things. The biggest one was the save and load speeds. So it took them 15 minutes to save a scene or load a scene. And so he said sometimes he would forego saving a take because he thought he could get a better one and he wouldn't. And then he regretted not saving it. And when we did the demo to him on Unity, uh, we you know had a team of seven guys um, working on that demo and we built this whole pipeline. We, we had to change the rendering at the time. Uh, to be HDR buffer, filmic curve, correct. And then um, basically uh, he came to, to, to lift the virtual camera, and then we said, sorry, we have to reload the scene. And by the time he was here, we had reloaded it. And we didn't know any, you know, realize that that's very special because we're used to it. Uh, but his team realized it, and he's like, you know, they just loaded the scene in half a second, you know. Um, so those those are small things, but they add up, you know. And, and so we we've been developing the tool since. Um, this is a footage I'll show you um, of the quality we were able to get back then in 2010. Um, it's basically running on a 590, Nvidia 590, and it's a 60 FPS 1080p. And that's a high-res Master Chief from Halo Legends. That's a film model. It's a, quarter of a million polys for the character. You get the idea. I'm going to go quick. So uh, you know that was Cook Torrance shaders that we uh, were collaborating with Weta on, Joe Leteri's team. Uh, we also did real-time ray tracing. I, uh, maybe I'll show this because this seems to be a theme, <laughs> just for the hell of it. Um, so this is, again, 2010, 2011. Uh, we, we connected 32 590s NVIDIA cards in a room, the only room at Microsoft that could provide the power and cooling. So this is the same content I just showed you, uh, but it's real-time ray tracing at 720p. Now the significance isn't that, hey, we rendered it in real time. The significance was I got to light it and tune all the materials in 20 minutes. And traditionally, that would have been two months and two TDs, because every shot is going to get, get given to two TDs, and then someone's going to tune it, you know, and do, render the shot overnight. Uh, that floor being rough there, I dialed that intensity in real time. It, it was, you know, amazing to have that ability. I just wish we were able to be more successful productizing it back then. Um, so the same tool that we developed uh, at Microsoft, we, we um, made a new version after I left Microsoft, and it's called Exposure. The tool at Microsoft is called Photon for, for Jungle Book and Ready Player One. Uh, but Exposure is now um, our own tool that we're, we're marketing and working on, on projects we, we uh, used on Blade Runner as well as Greyhound. Uh, but the same tool that's on my laptop could be used on a big mocap stage with 14 characters streaming in, or I could be on an airplane composing my shots. Uh, so that's the versatility of multiple inputs. So we built it from the ground up uh, to ha allow multi-users to be able to plug into the same scene. So on Jungle Book, there could be 10 artists moving things around for John Favreau, or in Ready Player One, uh, Spielberg could, could have changes done on the fly. Uh, you know, five artists, 10 artists, 15. Um, 
and, and by the time Ready Player One rolled around, we were able to do bi-directional. So it didn't matter if someone's moving something in, in Unity or Maya or Motion Builder. Uh, the key thing about it was the uh, flexibility of bringing assets into Unity. It's very, very easy to just drop the FAX. You already have your textures and materials set up. Uh, that's the reason uh, uh, I chose Unity in the first place. And then we've been able to benefit from all the C-sharp flexibility. So we were dynamically fixing or changing or adding features on set while the camera's rolling. So uh, it took Spielberg a few weeks to realize he had the power to change absolutely anything without putting down the camera or, or stopping. You know, anything could be changed on the fly, uh, whether it's lighting, positions, characters, modifying things on the fly. So that's, that's super powerful. This is Alex McDowell in Order of Seven. Uh, we had people like storyboard artists benefiting from uh, realizing um, what the set looks like. Uh, we had... Um, uh, the wardrobe designer changing the dress because she didn't realize the room was so tall. This was just giving accessibility to everybody on production that they could basically visualize the scenes. That's it, just location scouting. Uh, for Ray Pellerin, as I said, we had uh, a lot of inputs here. I'm going to play this uh, video that HTC Vive put together. This is the Oasis, a whole virtual universe. When I was writing Ready Player One, the virtual reality was still this science fiction thing in the future that we didn't have. And now, we actually had the HTC Vive on the set. Wow. So it was amazing that the virtual reality technology that has come about just since the book has been published was used in the movie. This is the coolest thing ever. One of the interesting things about a virtual production is that you're creating all of these sets and characters in the computer. And the great thing about that is that we could bring Steven in and he would put on the really high fidelity headset VR and we could load up that environment and he could scout it virtually. Oh, wow. And of course, because he's a filmmaker, as soon as he would start walking around a location, he would start thinking about shots. I needed to know where to put my camera. So they created an avatar for me that you never get to see, but my avatar had a virtual camera. I could either do frame grabs or I could do actual shots by walking through the virtual sets. I'm getting shots on a V-cam in a V-world. This is crazy. And the cool thing about the Vive is that he could say, I don't want that, move that out of the way or you know, remove this. And in real time, an artist kind of off to the side could just make adjustments kind of on the fly. The best place would be on this particular platform here. So it's a really interesting way of designing shots and designing your sets kind of in real time. Because in, in the background, you've got the Iron Giant. It's pretty cool. Any director or actor is quite used to reacting to their environment and understanding where they are. And so shooting a motion capture movie can be a slightly strange experience. If you're acting in a white room with a white ceiling and white walls and a bunch of computer cameras looking down at you, it's confusing for any actor and a director to walk onto a bare naked set and try to imagine what's there. So I asked each of the actors to also put on the headsets and enter the virtual set so we didn't have to imagine. It was there. All we had to do was remember. Shooting a motion capture is challenging in many ways, and you can't really get a sense of what it's like to be in the room or what it's like to be surrounded by the environment. So to put on the vibe is completely free. All right. So um, the interesting thing was when um, S Steven was trying, uh, you know, location scouting the sets, um, he kept having to take the visors off so he could drink his drink. And so what they did was they put mocap markers on it and gave him a virtual one. <laughs> so he, he always could know where the drink is. True story. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> um, so this is uh, the, the kind of different elements for the tool now. Um, uh, basically, uh, the developers, Wes Potter and the team, built a graph node editing system for Unity. So you can actually program using graph nodes. And then the entire system is built on that system. Uh, so you don't have to be a programmer to make your own camera, make your own rig, you know, and modify things. And uh, even I could use it. I've been using it. Um, then we have uh, Exposure, which is the tool itself. Uh, and then uh, Hermes is the communication network <coughs> protocol that I, t I told you guys about. It's a new version that we built, like a 3.0, uh, completely from the ground up. Uh, Hydra is all the multiple input devices. I got two controllers up here. These are the Xbox Elite, which uh, 
do actually, in fact, have way better digitization, so you'd want to spend the extra bucks. Uh, and the directors like the weight. Um, and then uh, Cyclops is something I'm going to demo with, uh, which is these two devices are using today. This is the node graph system I was talking to you about. Um, you can uh, right click and create nodes, and they can access any variable within Unity or any variable you, you make yourself. And then uh, you could easily choose if you want that variable to show up as a slider, and then how to connect them together. Uh, and so each component of the system is, is basically tapping into this. And you can modify the wiring while the unit is running, uh, your scene's running, and you can watch the differences. You can hover the mouse over the wires and tell all kinds of things. So it's pretty handy. So it used to be, had to be on a big giant mocap stage. And then since uh, developing uh, depth sensors and things like that, this is a Lenovo Tango. Um, unfortunately, Google has discontinued Tango, but I still like the device. So I hope they continue it, please. Um, Basically, my virtual camera can be as big as the room I'm in. So this thing will digitize the room on the fly. It doesn't need to see it beforehand. Uh, I can walk out here and out in the hallway, and as far as the Wi-Fi can receive it, uh, it'll be the size of my room. So this is a, a really big freeing thing, uh, and we use this extensively uh, on both Blade Runner and, and Greyhound. Uh, for Blade Runner, Denny used this controller. Um, I didn't necessarily need to give him the joystick stuff. We were just managing that, and then he was just uh, moving the camera. Uh, obviously, any kind of uh, modern input device will work great. Uh, I'll show you these from Blade Runner. So late in the game, I was brought in uh, in all of Post, working with John Nelson, consulting for visual effects, uh, helping the, the project. And then along the way, we realized there's some shots that need to be redone. Uh, this particular one is my favorite, because uh, this is in Trash Mesa. Uh, basically, the spinner had to go around that pylon and over the ship, and that's where it gets harpooned. And this was to be two shots, and they were going to join it together as one shot. And what happened was, um, you know, we, we had like four weeks to go, uh, not a lot of time to get iterations on keyframing. And what I proposed to Denny, was, let's try and do this in real time. So what he did was, uh, first thing, I had him fly the spinner. So the animation of the spinner is just him using the virtual camera to fly because I just connected the spinner to the camera. So he flew the spinner, and the first thing happened was he ran around the corner and crashed. He just realized the original move we planned was impossible. Uh, so consulted with the editor, Joe, and he said, you know, all he would do is try and gain altitude as soon as he's getting shot at. So that's what he's doing here. He's right away uh, on cue. He's getting shot at, and he's going to say, OK, I'm going to gain altitude. Then I put him back in the seat of the spinner, and then he performed the camera. So this entire shot was performed in about 15 minutes. And then the keyframes, the shot you see in the movie is keyframe for keyframe, exactly what this, what he did with the spinner and the camera. Um, this is another shot that was uh, really tough. This is the Wallace Towers and the spinner flying into it. Uh, it was a miniature shot, so we couldn't really modify the camera. Uh, and it was very difficult for us, whatever we would try in terms of uh, differentiating the depth and trying to get the audience to understand where they are, it was really, really difficult. Uh, so again, I proposed to Denny, let's location scout this. And he found this really interesting angle. This shot is a combo of uh, I'm performing the dolly move, and he's performing the camera head. So you can always have multiple people operating. Uh, you know, If you want someone to do focusing, someone to do the lens, uh, it's usually easier that way. But the shot has a really natural feel to it. And you know, very, as subtle as the move is, you just have a sense of, sense of scale here. Um, next up, this is uh, just a side story. We, there's this shot with the pilot fish drone inside Vegas. And um, I had brought this scene in for Denny to try the virtual camera to get used to it. And we have a drone simulator. And he, he flew around, and then he told me um, it took them two months to do the shot using storyboards. And so he realized you know, if they had real-time tools, he would have just been able to perform it. Uh, not that storyboarding is a bad thing, but it's uh, sometimes more useful to just experience something live. Um, last but not least, this shot was entirely new addition. It was, it was supposed to replace the shot after it that says leaving Los Angeles. Uh, and then 
then he wanted to show the relationship between LA, the seawall, and the ocean, and the spaceship. And there wasn't really any shot that did that. And so after uh, doing a lot of location scouting and looking at different angles, this is what he uh, did himself freehand. He just, you know, cameras uh, running, and he just, you know, lifted it up to show uh, to show the bottom of the sea. And then um, he's a very decisive director. You know, he knows what he likes, and it was like that's it, done. We send this. And then luckily, Dineg was able to uh, turn this around and render it in time. The trash maze shot was a frame store shot that I showed you before. And the, this one, I have the final here. <coughs> so you can see uh, it's exactly the same move. And this is the beauty of having all, all digital shots. It's very, very fun to play around and just be able to you know, fix something or improve something or, or, or create entirely new shots. So after, the, after they screened the film, they realized that actually they needed more time for him to travel from LA to, to the orphanage. And so this became an added shot, and they kept the leaving Los Angeles shot because he, he just felt like they needed that time. So that was, that was very helpful. Uh, moving on to Greyhound, this is a Tom Hanks film where he's the captain of a uh, naval destroyer in World War II. And um, the film is in production, so I can't show any shots from it, but I can talk about the pipeline, and I have a sample scene to show you. Uh, about what we did with the oceans. I gave a talk at the NVIDIA uh, booth and the NVIDIA room, um, both Monday and Tuesday, about uh, collaborating with NVIDIA and uh, Manuel, Kramer, and Tim uh, on um, them working on generating real-time waves for me that we were able to use in the production. So uh, that's a, a fantastic thing. I think they're going to post that online. Uh, but anyway, we, we figured out a pipeline of a uh, way to bring things into Unity that makes the most sense for the production. So, um, you know, initially it might sound, you know, easier to say just bring in the whole scene, but it's actually really helpful to, to very thoughtfully bring things in the way you need it. So, for example, uh, the oceans we just brought in as a Lembex, and that was just a streaming, uh, you know, mesh. Uh, quite high res, the files could be 25 gigs. Our scenes were 30,000 frames. Uh, but what I like about the project the most um, was uh, director Aaron Schneider and Tom Hanks trusting me to build a new pipeline and a new way to do the visualization for the film. So, you know, the film is a historically based uh, uh, story, and so they had accurate information about where everything was and where they went. And this was all. Uh, reconstructed by a team we put together of uh, six artists at Playtone. And uh, the idea was, instead of the traditional pipeline, I think I have a diagram here somewhere, um, traditional pipeline of doing every, every shot is done separately and every shot's animated and then you know, it, it, it's keyframe camera, uh, cameras are keyframed and then you play blast it and you iterate with the director. Instead, what we chose to do is um, bring in the entire scene as one scene. So we had 45 master scenes representing the whole film. You just, we just brought in the scene and then just shot it, just like you're shooting a documentary. You're shooting what happened. And so you're able to go anywhere, put your camera down, any kind of camera rig, pick your lens, all the primes matched what they were using on set, and then we were able to film the scenes that way. So as a you know, precaution, the production wasn't sure that method was going to work, so they had Six artists continued using the old-fashioned way of keyframing cameras in Maya. And then at the end of the first day, it was a little obvious which way to go. Uh, by the way, that was uh, John Bruno DPing the virtual cameras. He's worked with Cameron for a long time. He's a director and, uh, and a DP. And so uh, we were able to bring in and shoot an entire scene in two or three hours. And, and just basically, the editors couldn't keep up. We're just sending them. Setting shot after shot after shot, uh, you know, averaging maybe uh, two to three hundred. So that that became really successful because um, if the editors needed something new, that's like, hey, you know, we're missing a shot from this angle, or we really like to cover cover this from here. It was instant. You know, it would take three minutes to load the scene, shoot that, send it. You know, you don't even think about it, and it's very very lively. So that's my motto here. Uh, <laughs> Um, and you know, maybe the, I'm sure there's cases where you really have to keyframe a camera, but um, this is the old, what I was describing, which is the old pipeline. 
of every scene for itself, every shot for itself. And then this is what we did. And with the addition of, of course, that your filming is real time. So I got some cool live demos now. We go into this. Let me fire up some devices. And uh, let's see. Yeah, this should work. All right, so we're live with these. I'll start with the Blade Runner scene and show you the tool. I'm just running a, a standalone executable now. The running on my, my poor little laptop, but it's a pretty cool one. It's, a, it's got an NVIDIA 1060, it's an MSI. Uh, now, my favorite moment is when you connect the virtual camera. This is where the magic starts. So what you're seeing is now the camera position being sent live. I'm going to break free from the dolly. And this is our base rig. Uh, what I like to do is I like to position myself with the joysticks. This is mostly for offset purposes, but you can use, certainly use it to shoot a shot. Um, but uh, I have a lot of VCAM scale here, so I can walk around. You know, I don't know how far can we go. <laughs> I'm going to lose the, lose the spinner now. Where is it? Oh, there it is. So you know, I can keep, keep going and kind of you know, outside the room. As long as the Wi-Fi reaches, this thing is going to work. Now, um, we have some options we put in for smoothing. So you, can, uh, you don't have to necessarily worry about how much coffee you drank that day, although some directors like that. Uh, and then um, some of the basic capabilities. So, First thing you want to do is uh, be able to move around, you know, change your position. Uh, make, sure, make sure you have like a, a nice vertical position here. Uh, the next thing is to do with the lens. Uh, let me focus on this thing, just spot focus. Um, we have actually, uh, make, make sure I am using the correct lenses. Because we did a lot of demos yesterday and I don't know which one I ended up with. Yes, this, these, are, these are the Roger Deakins uh, prime lenses. Um, which um, he loves the 27, and it's, there's never such a thing as a 28. That's what you need to know if you work with Roger. Um, this is the high-res spinner that Dineg rendered. Uh, just be able, I was able to bring in all the uh, previous assets that MPC had built around. That's the city and the seawall and everything. And then uh, drop, the, drop the spinner from, um, from Dineg in here. So I'm going to do a series of shots right now. Let me see. Uh, first thing we want to do is anchor to this spinner. Otherwise, it's going to leave without us. Uh, so now, if I hit play, we're actually flying along. And uh, let me. What I want to do is uh, I want to rewind. Uh, we have t full time control. This is not easy to do in game engines. This is running at 24 FPS, and I can frame by frame, and I can jog wheel. So very, very handy time tools. And uh, with John Bruno, we always did a back to one, you know, shoot, shoot, keep shooting, keep shooting, which helps a lot. Uh, a big feature is bookmarking here. So I just uh, memorized exactly where I am, what rig I was using, what time I can come back to. This is very important in filmmaking. And we're going to do a take now. Going to copy Denis a little bit. All right. Next thing I want to do is I want to go inside. And as you can see, my VCAM scale is going to be super, super large in there. So what I need to do is uh, I need to reduce my virtual camera scale. So I'm going to basically become um, closer to one to one, maybe even less. And then um, now we can go inside. I can change the speed of my uh, joysticks because they're, they're quite, quite, uh, quite fast right now for large scale. Um, it, it's important to be able to work with different scales. Let's go inside. This is a pretty, uh, pretty nice model they built. So now I'm in the driver's seat. I'm going to go a little wider. And uh, let's see. I'm gonna, I have probably a little too much VCAM scale still. Let's drop that a bit. That's pretty good. All right. So let's rewind slightly. And I'm going to bookmark this and do this shot. Okay. Uh, next thing I want to do is a telephoto. So I'm still anchored to the 
spinner here. Uh, let's see, how's that? Get a nice little handheld uh, shake feel to it. Uh, backing up a little bit. And recording. All right, next thing I'm gonna do is I want a dolly shot. So I'm gonna go back to wide and switch to a dolly rig. Let's see, that would be here. So here I have a dolly and uh, I can see like the speed's pretty good. I'm going to anchor myself to the spinner. We're flying along, great. So now I'm gonna need a volunteer because this is more fun when you collaborate. Who's volunteering to do the dollying for me? Anybody? All right. Here you go. So uh, the left joystick is the dolly control. I want you to push uh, up on the left joystick, get a feel for that. That's a little fast, let's slow you down. Okay, try that. Keep going. You can push it all, you peg it. Is that the max? Yeah. Okay, that's a slow now. There we go, that's good. Perfect, so uh, keep, uh, let's start in front of the spinner, go forward. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, that's cool, nice. Fantastic, all right. So I'm gonna say action, you start dollying, right? So three, two, one, action. Go back the other way, sorry. <laughs> yeah, counter. Sweet, that was pretty nice. Let's try that again. Someone needs to keep count for me. How many shots have we done? <laughs> Aha, this is testing if you're awake. Nice. OK, so five, the fifth one is an NG, because we, we went the wrong way first, OK? Ready? Yep. All right, bookmarking again. And here we go. Very nice, very nice. And then lastly, I'm going to do an aerial. Uh, I'm going to go high up here. Let's see. Um, what's a good angle? Yeah, let's show how tiny it is, right? <laughs> That's good. So let's, uh, why don't you give me the subtlest, um, here, I'll slow you down so you can do very subtle uh, backwards like this. So the spinner takes over a little bit, right? Sound good? Try that. The other way. Yeah, it starts in frame. Keep coming, keep coming. Yeah, we'll start there, and then that's a, keep going. That's a perfect exit. So let's go back to where it's near the bottom. Perfect. Let's start there. Okay. All right. And action. Sweet. All right. Now let's see what we did. So we go to review. Thank you, by the way. That was great dollying. So how many shots was that total? Eight or nine. Damn it. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think it was seven. Wasn't it? What was it? 14? 13. Really? OK, I got to see this. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> that means that the fifth one was an NG, which was this one, right? We skipped 17. We didn't do this many takes. No, 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 I don't think so. Hold on. No, that's not it. Let's see. Um, actually, I could have, uh, let's see. In fact, the reason we put numbers there to begin with, by the way, is because um, we, we were doing so many shots that we, we, did, we gave up re you know, post-rendering them because the tool renders it super fast afterwards. We were just recording HDMI. It was just like this is for you know 300 renders. <laughs> you know we could have easily done it, but it was like why why bother? Let me start with 17 and see where we at. 17. That's not it. We're gonna get to it. I think that's it. 18. That's okay. We'll get one extra shot now. Um, What I forgot is to play the soundtrack. Let's see. The 
So um, basically, uh, a lot of sophisticated rigs we've developed this ability to um, curve around, you know, to, to do your start, middle, end, bang, 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 you know, get what you want. Um, thank you very much. That was good. Very cool. So for my next trick, now we're going to up the ante here. This is a totally experimental, so it may not work. But uh, I need you to now hold the camera. <laughs> He's like, damn it. All right, so hold on. Don't move. I'm going to orient you around here. OK, so there we are. I'm going to get you, whoops, a little fast. Get you a little closer. All right, we're going to do a combo shot here, OK? And um, let's see, spinner is focused. Uh, I didn't even go over the depth of field settings. But yeah, you can change your t-stop. And uh, the bouquet and all that's based on the lens information that comes with the, with the specific primes or cameras. Um, but uh, here we go. All right. So what I want to do is um, launch this one. If we get lucky, this will work. This is, this is a hot off the press feature. So I might need to restart. Let me restart this really quickly. But it'll be worth the wait. So we added a feature where you can have multiple inputs uh, from, from the devices. This is my Pixel 2 phone. Uh, so you look down, if you look down, we're, we're live. All right, woohoo! I'm flying a spinner. So are you ready to do a shot? Now, I need you to not follow me all the way, because my arms are only so long, right? So you got to let it leave the frame, but you can follow it a little bit. Sound good? Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go up like that. OK. Sweet. Here we go. Everybody always wanted to fly a spinner. All right, I'm going to bookmark that. And three, two, one, rolling. Nice job. <laughs> hey. All right, let's do that. Now, now I want to get the headlights in the shot, which is going to be tricky, because I have to face the camera to myself. And I don't know how it's going to do that kind of tracking. But Ooh, look at that. Uh, Maybe you can help me. Why don't you? Can, you're, are you a gamer? Yeah, I am. Cool. So can you go to the other side of uh, the spinner to go, to go where the headlights are pointing? There you go. Hey, I picked the right guy. <laughs> cool. All right, all right. That's good. Go a little more over to the right. No worries. I think you, you need the joystick inverted, don't you? All right. So come a little closer to me. OK, that's perfect. Let's do this. All right. I'm going to take off and aim at you, point the lights like that, OK? Here we go. It's kind of weird doing it backwards. All right, screenshot, and three, two, one, rolling. Nice. <laughs> OK, this is too fun. All right, now let's see what we did. So I'm going to go back into review. And I, don't, I know we just did two takes, so I don't have to count. Yeah, so that's why it displays the take number at the top when you're shooting, because we had to when we're recording HDMI, we needed to know. Hey, that's cool. This one, I think I started going the wrong way first. Yeah, I was like, oh, the other way. <laughs> nice, awesome, thank you. That was cool. Last demo, this is the Greyhound stuff. Here, I'll take that back from you. So uh, I have a sample scene from Greyhound. This is just a cool combination of a whole bunch of stuff. I didn't uh, finish talking about how we split the assets. So when it came to the crew on board the ship, because uh, you have to imagine we had you know, 54 ships, you know, two, four really high-res ones, one with a crew of uh, 50 um, on board. Uh, let's see. I'm going to move over. Um, 
million polys per destroyer here. And then at the same time, you want to be able to update, say, what the captain did or what what's the characters did. So what we did was we ended up splitting up the, uh, the uh, FBXs. So the bridge wing and, and the pilot house was one FBX. And then all the gunners and weapon people were on a different FBX. And then all the lookout guys, which are always there, um, are on a, on a separate layer. The nice thing with that is that you could get away with looping some generics. You know, you could, you could bring in, you know, the lookout guys could be on a loop. And then if you needed uh, K-guns launched, you can just drag those guys in and, and uh, cue the timing. Uh, the exposure tools also allow you to shift the timing of FBXs. Uh, and also we can do frame by frame on particles. So this is all, uh, you know, what, what, you, what you get as part of the tool. So um, let me see. Um, the director, Aaron, always insisted on uh, shots being ship to ship, nothing helicopter, because it wouldn't be realistic. So I'm going to anchor myself to this ship. And then you'll notice uh, when I go down here, if I hit play, uh, I'm not moving relative, relative to the ship I'm on. So we're kind of locked to that. But this is nice, because now I can react to what's going on with the waves. Uh, so let's do a shot here. I'm going to sim simply uh, pick a lens bookmark that and then run it. And then you can see the ocean streaming uh, via FBX. And I have a basic um, foam shader uh, on there and then I'm just offsetting that to, to move. But the actual Waveworks team from NVIDIA has way, way more sophisticated tools that, that show um, uh, all the di different foam, foam layers. Uh, we weren't able to program all that in. Um, but here's, here's what we shot. So like I said, we, uh, John Bruno and I and some uh, Greg Strauss from Hydraulics uh, Visual Effects House on the project also uh, would dive in and operate the camera. And Aaron Schneider uh, also um, had some experience using our shoulder cam. Uh, so I'm going to go through some bookmarks here. Uh, this one's a good one. So this is a dolly on the ship. And if you notice, it's not anchored. So if I hit play, basically, I would lose my place. Uh, or and I wouldn't lose my place. I'd just be floating. So I'm going to anchor that guy. And this is a good time to show the, the depth of field effects. So uh, controlling my T-stop or changing my focus from far to near. Um, you can also tap focus. So depending on what you're tapping on, you just get focus on that. Um, so that you can have somebody just like uh, we had the person using the dolly. What's your name? Jan. 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 Uh, it, it would be, yeah, here. Yeah. You're back on dolly duty. <laughs> 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 All right, let's do this. So this is a backward dolly. Uh, sorry, I set it up. So down goes forward. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, ready? Is that a good speed? Uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go right through the fence. Yeah. An impossible shot. Aaron would kill me. OK, let's keyframe and rolling. Yeah, go forward. All right, sweet. Um, lots of possibilities. My favorite, actually, in this scene is um, uh, one of the things, you know, each show you work on make, makes you be really robust with certain tools. And in this show, it was the anchoring system. We had to be locked to anything at any speed. This airplane is going 120 uh, miles an hour. And I can lock to it, shoot my shot. And then when we play it back, it has to play back completely locked and nailed. So these are, these are the, you know, the when you work in production, the benefits of being able to uh, prove out certain things. Uh, our anchoring system uh, is really easy because all you have to do is double tap and you're in. And then um, the ability to control a lot of options, like whether you want to follow something's rotation, what axes you want to follow, all those things. So sometimes we would anchor to the ship and then just follow it horizontally, but leave everything else free for you to do what you want. So let me see. That's. Perfect timing for 10 minutes of questions. This is, uh, we have one hour, right? So, cool, thank you. That was awesome.
Anybody need a virtual DP? This guy right here. Yeah. That's really cool. So the company is uh, Digital Monarch Media, and the tool's called Exposure. Um, and we like to work with indie directors. We'd like to work on uh, you know small projects, TV shows. Uh, you know, these days it would be crazy to try and just offline render if you're doing a TV series, digital c t TV series. I think. Uh, so the tools are there. You guys have seen uh, the latest of uh, the the good stuff. The Book of the Dead, the Unity's done to show uh, they're constantly pushing the visual bar, which is great. Um, so we have to do less work. We just focus on uh, virtual production and communication and cameras. Um, but uh, let's open it for questions. Hi, B. Yes. How are you connecting the Tango camera in to the Unity scene? Wi-Fi. Just Wi-Fi? Is there but a special script or anything? There's a special code that we wrote. Uh, and so I didn't show it, but I can also use the touch screen and change lens and change stuff on, on here. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's if you're on an airplane and you don't want to pull out this thing. <laughs> so we've made a whole set of controls that way. Uh, it's a really, really nice UI. Um, and you know, I have actually a router that's a that's this big. Uh, it's a USB pocket router. And if it was legal to have a, a router on an airplane, <laughs> uh, but you could pull that anywhere. I've done. I could have done this demo with it. You know, it just, you know, it's really amazing. But you could be on a train or you know wherever you are. And pop that little thing out, you know, and, and, and that's all you need. Yeah. Next question. There was a lot of hands. Hello. Hi. Um, what's the exchange workflow between the virtual production and visual effects? Like, what do you guys deliver to the visual effects house? Perfect and question. How does that work? Yes. We have a set of Python scripts that bring all the cameras and bookmarks <coughs> into Maya uh, so they can take that and do whatever they want with it. And it's going to match and line up with the scene that you brought in. Uh, and then uh, every time I bookmarked, there's a PNG. It takes, a, it takes an actual image. Uh, and then uh, there's offline rendering, which is super fast. Uh, it's in the, in the menus. Um, I guess I could have covered some of the camera options. But you know, all the options are there for you to pick your film back, uh, aspect ratio. You know, uh, we, I showed you the lens kit. You can customize that, what your primes are. Uh, you can dynamically zoom in a shot, uh, but but um, you know with hydraulics they were able to also come and use the virtual camera to shoot their own shots, uh, and you know it there's place for keyframing cameras I'm sure, uh, but once you've tasted that like re, 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 you know not recreating actually creating the same way that cinematography happens on a set. <coughs> You know, it becomes really tough to go back <laughs> to to uh, just doing it. You know, it, it adds a lot of dynamics to the shot. I wish I could show Greyhound footage, um, but yeah, there was you know there were scenes that were done uh, not with the virtual camera, and it just stood out like a sore thumb. And so they wanted to redo those using the tool. Next question. Oh, there was more hands up than that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> If you do the offline rendering, if you decide to do that, are you doing that for like increased uh, lighting, like changing the lighting and that kind of thing? You can. Oh, uh, shoot. Shame on me. I didn't even show the lighting tools. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a whole set of uh, tools to, to change lights around and lighting controls the way you're used to using them on a stage. Um, so for example, um, I don't know what's a good one. I guess that one is good. Uh, so basically. Um, uh, you, you, you move through your lights, change them how you want, and then you can save that and have different multiple times of day. You know, uh, So I'm just going to go here. You don't have to have the VCAM on. I can just have a controller on. And we also have uh, keyboard controls, the old-fashioned. Uh, but I'm going to pull up the lighting menu. So I'm going to edit lights here. So it's showing me the light name. So here's my sun, and I can uh, you know, dynamically move it around. Uh, the lower left is the view of the light, so I can see what I'm seeing with the light. Uh, and then we have uh, a lot of nice controls, like for example, uh, uh, degrees Kelvin. This is how DPs like to talk, you know, what's the temperature of the light. Uh, there's also, if you wanted to change the intensity and saturation or the hue, that's another way to do it. But the nice thing is, uh, 
you know, let's say, let's say uh, they change their mind and they wanted to do a subtler uh, lighting here. Uh, let's go into the fill light and drop that intensity too. Here we go, more silhouetted. Uh, so now I'm gonna say, um, you know, uh, apply the lighting and go back to shooting. Also, you notice there's a set. That's ability to move things around. So I can go and move things around in the set and then that information could go back to Maya as well. So now I'm going back to shoot mode. And then when I go to review view takes, well, guess what? Uh, everything we did has the new lighting because I never saved a frame. <laughs> Every, everything's live. Let's say someone says, hey, I just improved the sim on the ship, or I just got a new airplane model, right? Drag and drop into Unity auto updates automatically. You don't have to stop. And then you're back, uh, you know, watching your takes with the new lighting. And you, let's say you have some preset nighttime, daytime, you know, all the different times of day. You can just pull those up and, and pick those. And then at any point during a take, well, obviously you can scrub these. Uh, you can also save out a, save out a position and, and be able to do that. Um, so let me see if I go back to render menu. Rendering offline is very, very fast. Yeah, so it just, it just handles it, uh, creates a movie file for you, and then you pop it up. And we've, we've sped that up using uh, CUDA optimization and multi-threading multi on the GPU. So, uh, and then to answer your question, it could be 8K if you wanted to. Uh, and you could, you could up your anti-aliasing. You could definitely you know, bring in a ton more lights. You know? um, the show we ran on was uh, we used a 1080 Ti machine. And man, that thing can take, I mean, when I told you we had 54 ships and 40 characters and you know, uh, lots of other vehicles, that's all in the scene. I wasn't hiding anything. I could have flown to ship number 45, <laughs> you know, picked a lens, it just, it just handles it. You know? um, that's really the beauty of, of, of uh, cards these days. So hope that an answers your question. Yeah, it's, it's super fun to work this way. And you don't hesitate to make your improvements and your changes, you know, because it's, it's fast and easy. Um, yes, uh, our DP. <laughs> yeah, I've got a question about uh, your experience with exposure and, uh, I guess, live comps. So, like, more like AR yes. style, like, mounting in this onto, like, a camera. And, like, you know, yeah. like, NCAM yes. sort of thing. Yeah, we just did a test actually working on a commercial and um, with this sensor, uh, we strapped it to a camera, tracked the take and shot it, shot the take on the camera. Uh, and what happens is it, you can get a live preview by just DXing it or doing a green screen with Ultimat. Right. And what you'll see is basically this kind of thing, yeah. right? You'll still see your set, you'll see the virtual stuff really nicely, but it'll be like this and then uh, the director did a post 2D stabilize on it, and it was rock solid. Like it lines up right. super well. Right. Uh, so we were we were really impressed, and we were doing you know complicated moves with it. Now I would recommend if you work with us, let's say you're on a project, what we would recommend for simulcam would be something like a Hololens, right. just more precise. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's just less and less. You need the the giant mocap stage, and mocap stages can don't operate well with real world lighting. Right, yeah. So if, you, if you're doing simulcam, that means you've got live actors or something live that you're lighting with really hot lights. Yeah. And mocap cameras are infrared. Right. <laughs> so uh, when I was at EA, we did a test where we're like, all right, let's see, you know, mocap, you can tell them to block certain areas to ignore. It's, it's, it doesn't really work. It's really hard. Uh, but, you know, there's active markers. There's all kinds of things like that. Okay. But, um, you know. We, we've had pretty good luck with these. Awesome. Is that it for time? Yep. Dead on. Wow. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh,